this is a Matterhorn, okay? And it looks like we could lose with uh, climate change, we could lose part of it. So maybe it's the last time you see it like that, okay? <coughs> because of the permafrost which is melting and seems that some rocks could leave the, this kind of beautiful mountain. Anyway, my talk will be on repurposing drugs and high throughput when I say high is the middle throughput, but it, we are doing it in macrophage and trying to find out uh, new drugs. So as you know, there are only few drugs against, le and, uh, against Leishmania, like uh, pentavalent antimony or antimony, miltefazine, paromamycin, amphotericin B, and the last development, which is a liposomal amphotericin B. So you also know that we had different type of disease, different type of pathologies caused from cutaneous, mucosal, disseminated, diffused, and visceral leishmaniasis. And uh, in some cases, like in the case of metastatic leishmaniasis that we mentioned yesterday, and you will see I take some slides of yesterday to try to make some kind of continuum in my talks. In these cases, and it was mentioned by Iv Ivanka, 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 yes, yesterday, that there are relapses to specific treatments, so pe patients relapse after the first line therapy, and you could wonder if we don't need different drugs. So this project started years ago when we had uh, somebody from Bern call me and said, oh, I have a strange case. He's a dermatologist and he said, I have a strange case of somebody who is co-infected with HIV and possibly leishmaniasis. But really, if you look at the pathology, she had lesion like I never saw for somebody who is co-infected. So, and uh, the the person, in fact, was coming back from Paraguay. She stayed in Bolivia. She had a series of small crusted skin lesions, and they were treated for another type of disease. She was also uh, shown to be HIV positive, so and, uh, but the uh, number of T cells were not very high, uh, not very low, and the number of viral copy was okay, not too high, and she was given an antiretroviral therapy. Even so, lesion keep going. And because of that, he said, I saw your paper, and maybe there could be some viruses in this uh, Leishmania brasiliensis. And, uh, oh, in addition, she started to have some kind of dry rhinite, rhinite, rhinitis and uh, some, some bleeding in the nasal septum. And uh, so we started to follow, did a lot of studies, and uh, because of that, she, starts, she was started to be treated for, uh, against leishmaniasis, and she had these really big uh, lesions. So we isolated the parasite in collaboration with the uh, Swiss Tropical Institute in Basel, and, uh, and ident identified the presence of the virus inside the parasite, as you can see here with the green staining, using an antibody against a capsid. And uh, then we, she was treated well with lip, uh, liposomal amphotericin B, very heavy treatment, and uh, she started to heal two weeks later. And that's what you can see. This is before the treatment, after the treatment, and now uh, this was some weeks after the, the starting of the treatment, and she's absolutely fine now with her leishmaniasis. So because of that, we said, mm, that's something strange. He said, uh, maybe there could be something different between when you have the virus, not the virus. And we started to study and uh, were interested in developing uh, specific, specific or, or repurposed, repurposed drugs. Then we had these studies uh, that we did in, the, in French Guyana with Elian uh, Bourreau. And there where we observed that we have relapses when people <coughs> were carrying, were infected by Leishmania goyenensis and carrying the LRV. So when you had the LRV inside goyenensis, you can see that they needed one or two treatment that was with pentaminin, and often they had to go with a further treatment which was glucantan. That's the way they treated the, in uh, French Guyana. It was not the case with uh, LRV negative Leishmania goyenensis. And then uh, this, it was the initial period, these patients were followed, and uh, when you, what you could observe is after one year, the, 
the patients who were treated of this, who were relapsing were, may, were really the patients who were carrying Leishmania Goyen disease with the virus. This study helped the study with Leishmania Brazilian disease. They asked us to publish back to back. So uh, we share the data and they studied uh, Leishmania Brazilian disease and showed similar results for the, pre the, inf the impact of LRV in relapsing. I would like to mention uh, a recent study that I mentioned already briefly yesterday. It's the presence of one isolate of Leishmania RNA virus, and this is a type 2 in VL, in Leishmania uh, in phantom. And in this case, it was isolated from a child. It was done in Iran, and it was isolated from a child who was resistant to the treatment. So there, are, there could be some cases in the field. So there are rare cases, okay? It's not the mainstream, but this kind of, if, we have, if you observe this kind of things, maybe I would go and try to look if the virus is present and to add some data on this relapsing. So now I come back to what I said yesterday. You see that we were, yeah, we studied with the field, went to the bench, and now we go back to the field. So I've really followed what Philip said yesterday. So field, bench, field. So this is still, these are data from the, from the bench. And what I showed you is when the virus is present, you have a TLR3 activation. You can induce survival in, of infected macrophage. And you have inflammation with interferon beta, alpha or beta, which is produced, type 1 interferon, inflammatory markers, uh, IL-6 and so on, and metastasis. So are they targets in these pathways? And there is a series of targets that you can try to hit. And uh, I think, and you can take advantage of what's going on in the cancer field, because you have a lot of kinase. So if you look, you have, if you go on this arm on macrophage survival, you have Cjun kinase, you have AKT, I showed you the AKT phosphorylation. These are potential targets. On the other side, you have TBK, which is a tank binding kinase 1, induce uh, IRF3, interferon beta, and interleukin 17, and metastasis. And this is one, so you could really go on the immunopathology side and see what you could target in these cases, or you can also look for trying to target the parasite inside the macrophage. So first things that we did, among the different things that we did, we, we tried to target IL-17. And what I showed you yesterday is the following. Uh, just I remind you what I said. So it's a good for the, was the last talk. So I can understand that maybe certain things you did not really follow. So here you have this TLR3 pathway with IL-6, TH17, IL-17A. Then you have this really strong inflammatory response on different cell type and, mem and MMPs which are produced and so on. And you can get this hyperinflammation. I re just to remind you, so in Acute patients, so you, after a few months of infection, they have a high level of in, interleukin 17A, low interferon gamma, and you have a strong ratio IL-17A interferon gamma in these patients. So the patients carrying ILRV. So we have a model, and the model that I showed you yesterday is this gamma knockout model. So when, you have, when LRV is not present in Leishmania goyenensis, you have only foot pad development. When it's present in the gamma knockout mice, what you have is presence of lesions on the tail. And you can quantify lesions. And so what we did, and I go quickly, I don't want to go into the, to the detail. So we used inhibitors of IL-17 expression. And among them, we use digoxin in a small molecule, which is in development in a company in the States. So we have digoxin, which is used in, hum in humans for our heart problems. So it's something which is currently used. It's not a perfect molecule, but it can be used. So and uh, what you can see is here, in the no you can score. We score the metastatic uh, number of uh, lesions. So you have a metastatic score. If you treat with digoxin, as soon as you start to see the lesion, I mean the lesion in the foot pad, then you treat with digoxin, you block metastasis, 
n with s r 1,000 and 1, you do the same thing. And uh, clearly, it's depending on IL-17. So we have, if now we have something that we could use just to block metastasis with due to IL-17. The <coughs> all the possibilities, so we have, this is probably, that could be quite useful. So the other possibility is to target the kinase. And I showed you that we have phosphorylation of AKT1. And there are many drugs which are, can be developed against uh, these different kinase. We started to study this one. And uh, before, I want to show you what we, what we, do, what we can do. And I think uh, this is an example with miltefazine. So miltefazine is quite a good drug, in fact. If you look, it's a very efficient drug. Uh, it's a very good to, uh, side potential side effect, and that's a problem of uh, miltefazine. It's an oral drug, but it's teratogen, so that's a major problem. Except that, I think it's a very efficient drug. So what we do, for example, here you have a footpath swelling. This is again in the gamma knockout mice. So we can use in immunocompromised mice, you can still treat them with your drug. So if you look here, you have the footpath swelling. The footpath is developing. And we can start to fee, I mean, to give miltefazine orally to the mice. And you can see that footpath goes down. And you can measure KMP11 in the tail. Uh, instead, of we can see lesions. But that's another way of doing it. So you can take here, you have the infection. We start the treatment. As soon we start to see the lesion in the footpath. And you can take sections of the tail. So we do section, we cut the tail in eight pieces, one centimeter each. And you can quantify the number of parasites in the tail. It's another way of doing it so than uh, luminescence. And what you can see is non-treated. And you can see that you have bumps. In fact, there are regions where you have more parasites than others, which correspond to lesions. And uh, when you treat with miltefazine, you know, then you clear everything. So miltefazine is pretty good. But when you do it with an inhibitor of AKT1, we didn't observe any uh, reduction in metastasis. So it means that probably for metastasis, uh, this is fine. AKT1 inhibitor is not good. So it's not efficient in all case, probably not strong enough. Uh, they could be all the kinase that we could uh, study. But uh, we decided to go a bit more into detail and to repurpose and try to analyze another series of drugs which were FDA uh, approved drugs. So and we did it in infected macrophage. So it means it's quite a setup because it's not taking promastigot and just throwing your drugs onto promastigot and counting your promastigot. It's really setting up everything to count in detail and the number of parasite per macrophage. And you don't want to do it by eye. It would take you forever. So we used the facility which is present in Geneva, which is set up by a consortium, a Swiss consortium, where we, which is a high content microscopy. And these kind of studies, they have been not with the same type of system, but they have been uh, set up by Gerald Spate in the Pasteur Institute in Paris. So we use the same kind of approach. So we take, in all case, we don't take uh, transform cells or THP1, whatever, we take urine bone marrow macrophage, and we, have a, we had to set up a very defined protocol to infect, to have enough macrophage, and then we work with MCSF. Then we verify that we really differentiated on macrophage, so every time we do a fax, and we work with a 96 well plate. We can increase it to 360 without any problem. We have a series of devices. Uh, so uh, there is, uh, you can put the drug automatically. There, is, there are robots to put the drugs in the 96 well plates. And you have uh, the microscope here to measure, to quantify the number of macrophage and parasite. So then, OK, we differentiate. We have the, these 96 well plates. We, you can put the drug you want. And then you have the microscope at the end. Uh, you infect with uh, Leishmania guayanensis parasite with or without LRV. And then uh, two days later, we switch the temperature. We, sh we observe that it was better to work at 35 than 37. We have more infection. We can work with different multiplicity of infection. We try always, you have to set up either if you want a MOI of 1 or MOI of 10. It's a lot of uh, setting up. Then you can add your compound. You fix with 4% PFA 
you stain and you analyze your image. So what are the staining? So the staining, the first staining that we do is a DAPI staining. When we do the DAPI staining, you can see the, here the macrophage nuclei and you can see here a mastigot inside the macrophage. <coughs> this is the first staining. So you can distinguish between nuclei of the parasite and nuclei of the macrophage. Then we do a phalloidine Alexa 488 staining, so then you can see if the macrophage is alive. So this is just to really s look for infected live macrophage. Then you can make your overlay, and in your overlay you can see really if you have here the nuclei, you, uh, you can see for example this one, you have the nuclei of the macrophage, you have the nuclei, of the parasite and you have the macrophage here with phalloidine staining. This is a live cells. But we have cells which are not alive, like this one, you have nuclei here, nuclei here, so we have to discard them, so not to count them. So that we set up all the program to how many macrophage do we have, how many are alive, and are they macrophage nuclei, amastigot nuclei. So then you can get this kind of picture so you can really define, this is, for example, a macrophage, and you can stain, you can ask a computer to stay, I mean the program, to stain your nuclei, macrophage nuclei versus your amastigot nuclei. And here you have the macrophage nuclei, here you have the amastigot, and you know it's a live cell. And you can, so we can analyze a single cell if you want. Uh, so we can follow really in detail this kind of uh, drug, and, uh, I mean drug screen. And we eliminate uh, things like that. For example, this one, this one, this one, and so on. So, then we had to set up the assay. So this is just, uh, just to show you here, this is the DMSO in which, is in which you solubilize and photoresin B. And you have here just the MSO, you can see here uh, Nuclei of, the amas nuclei of the macrophage plus amastigot around this is without any staining. And when you use amphotericin B, you don't see maybe from time to time one parasite. And you can, what we did again to set up to be sure we had the right assay, so we calculated IC50 to be sure that what we are doing correspond to what is published in the literature. And this is the assay for amphotericin B. We use, in this case, LRB+, plus Leishmania goyenensis, or Moyo-10, with a specific concentration of MCSF. So it gives you here well-defined uh, co uh, conditions, well-defined conditions, and we can calculate the IC50. The IC50 that we got is 0 0.0251. This IC50, and we have a level of, of confidence for over 95%. And uh, compared to THP1 cells, so we have uh, 0.3 uh, micromolar in Amazonensis and so on. So we know that it's working for amphotericin B. Show you a curve for, we did the same for miltafazine. It's not a perfect curve in this case, but anyway, we were able to calculate the IC50, which is around 4 micromolar for miltafazine. So we have a setup which is pretty, con uh, that we can trust. We can calculate, what we can measure whatever we want in terms of viability in every cell if we want. So then it's, this is the kind of image that you get. So you have in a 96 well plate, you have 49 image per well. So you can take in for every well, you have 49 image and you can accumulate a lot of data on, you, on your screen. This is the kind of analysis that you can do, for example, for miltefazine. So you have different parameters. In fact, you have here are different amount of miltefazine. So low concentration of miltefazine, high concentration of miltefazine that you have here. And you can calculate the number of parasites per macrophage, and you can calculate the number of macrophage. So you can see that you have, in some cases, you can have certain quite high level of micro, uh, certain number of macrophage and high level of parasites in all these cases. And when you start to increase your miltefazine concentration, you, what you observe is really that you decrease the number of parasites, you start to increase the number of macrophage. And if you pass a certain amount, then you can, be, you can see toxicity on the macrophage too. 
So it gives you the whole range of data that you want to cover. So you can, uh, you can identify a therapeutic dosage. It's, we are still in vitro. And you can, there are ways of to detect uh, metabolically active uh, compounds using specific uh, stain. So this is, uh, we use a, a library which is available, which is an FDA approved library, which is called the Presswick library. It's 12 of 1,200 compounds. And we did several, uh, we did, the, we repeated the experiment twice. And what you observed in this case is you have either red, this is a heat map, like uh, any kind of heat map for RNA uh, expression, for example. And you have the one which are in red here, uh, here where you have a low level of parasite. The yellow one, uh, the green one, uh, in fact, you, you have still a high burden. So you can have, and we always in all the screen, we put DMSO and infotericin B. You can see here DMSO, you still have uh, quite a lot of parasite. Infotericin B, you have red staining, means you kill the parasite. So, and then these are the series of hits that we have. Here are the seven hits that I showed you here. They are here. You can see that in these cases, we, from time to time, we see one amastigot. And uh, we did it twice, and we can have certain fluctuation. This is an overlay of two experiments. You can see here, for this is amphotericin B, the red one. The, the hits that we have <coughs> are here. You can have the macrophage count, the parasite count. And this is one on the top. I don't know if you see it on the top. Doesn't work very well. On the top, you have one experiment, and we repeated the experiment on the other case. So it depends on the quality of your parasite, quality of your macrophage, and you can have different level of, uh, for example, survival of your macrophage. But at the end, at the end of the day, anyway, you found a series of hits. So out of the 1,200, you can measure the percentage of inhibition. We did this experiment at 10 micromolar which is a standard way of doing when you start. And you can see which drugs induce more than 50, more than 70, seven, uh, more than 60, 70, 80, and 90. And you, we know many drugs. For example, what was quite interesting, in this library, you have miltefosine. You would expect that miltefosine ends up here. But in fact, we find it here. So it's just a little bit 80%. So you have to be extremely careful. You say, OK, uh, some drugs, <coughs> maybe they could be in vivo. They could be slightly different than what you observed in, uh, in macrophage. Anyway, uh, we, are, we will follow specific uh, candidates after discussion uh, with some specialists saying, first, we will take things which have not been described as against Leishmania, because many have been described, tested. Uh, we will look for oral drugs. And that's clear. Uh, we, there are some of them which, are, which have been used as cream, antifungal creams. So we will not uh, follow this one because we want something which is oral. Uh, we, so it's an IC50 and IC90. So we still have the IC50 we do have. We are still measuring the IC90. One thing that we, we are setting up in our faculty is a zebrafish system. So zebrafish is extremely useful because you can test your drug in the, in the fish and see if they are ter teratogenic. So you can know very quickly. And uh, then we can go in our metastatic uh, mouse model. I don't, I, I don't think it's interesting to show you the name of these drugs. Uh, it's not going to bring you anything, except that once what we found is some of these drugs are related to neurological disease. And uh, they have been in humans for a certain number of times. And I think it could be quite interesting to follow and to understand these kind of drugs. How do they block uh, Leishmania? So, or they kill Leishmania? So I think uh, just to conclude, uh, what we have, I think it's quite interesting. It's interesting in this terms of conditional mutualism between a parasite and a virus. For the parasites, it looks like it increased resistance to drug treatment. And that's a study by Buo and Adoi, and, uh, which was shown for Guayanensis and Brasiliensis. And I'm sure there will be additional studies on that. It's important for dissemination of the pathogen on the skin. 
and have new lesions and lesions which develop in probably in regions which are colder, like the nasal septum, where you have a slightly lower temperature. The tail also, the foot pad, uh, snout, tails, uh, ears, probably it's a question of temperature. And you increase the survival of the macrophage, of the infected macrophage, and therefore the parasite uh, burden. For the virus, I think it's interesting to have the parasite because it's a as for most of the virus or for all the virus, it gives, uh, it gives a replicative and survival machinery, but also the fact that it hides inside the parasite, uh, it protects from interfront type 1. So the parasite uh, is giving some kind of niche, uh, survival niche for the virus. So finally, if we think of Leishmaniasis uh, in Globally, so we, I think what is important for metastatic leishmaniasis and probably all the type of leishmaniasis, I think we should consider co-infection. Malnutrition is a major problem uh, and genetic polymorphism of the host, HIV infection, uh, which comes more or less to co-infection, which are sli maybe slightly different, but this affects really T-cells adaptive. That can affect the innate uh, response. Physical injury. Physical injury is just increase of inflammation. And we start to have data that uh, just by increasing inflammation, we will drive metastatic leishmaniasis, which is another case probably. And uh, then in the leishmania parasite, probably genetic polymorphism, the presence of viral endosymbionts. And you can imagine the phylogeny because you have more metastatic, in the case of metastatic leishmaniasis, it occurs more often in, South, in Central and South America. So my group, the person who did this work on uh, all this, the metastasis and drug miltefazine, AKT is honor. The person who did the studies is Dimitri Kopeliansky. Uh, he's not on the slide. Uh, he did all this kind of screening with the TLRs and uh, drug screen with the help of uh, Marta, she's here. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs>